Hello, I'm Dr. Tim Sandal and welcome to this video which is going to have a brief look at spores in clean rooms and the focus is on why spores are a problem but also that not all spores are equal okay we have bacterial and we have fungal spores but even within these two different kingdoms there are challenges that spores present And we begin with um, bacterial endospores. So some bacteria to address unfavorable conditions form endospores. And here a portion of the cytoplasm and a copy of the bacterial chromosome undergo a form of dehydration. And they become surrounded by what's typically a three layered covering. And this resulting structure, the endospore, can tolerate extreme environmental conditions. It's also resistant to desiccation, to most forms of temperature, unless we get up to really, really high temperatures, starvation, to a degree ultraviolet light, gamma radiation up to a certain tolerance level, and chemical disinfectants. The other interesting thing is that these spores can remain dormant for many years. So here we have on the slide the process of forming endospores. So here a portion of the bacterium becomes the spore. So the spore is formed. And at some point when conditions are favourable, the spore will generate back into a vegetative bacterial cell. And this process, this cycle of sporulation, of spore to vegetative cells and spores again, can theoretically carry on indefinitely. So with fungal spores, there are uh, some key differences to bacterial spores. So fungal spores are microscopic, active biological particles. And fungi can produce spores for two reasons. So first of all, they allow the fungus to reproduce. And this is a similar purpose to seeds within the kingdom of plants. Although the mechanisms of uh, production and distribution are slightly different. The names also vary, and this depends upon the type of fungus and its physiological state. There's another reason why fungi can produce spores, and sometimes these are special spores called chlamydospores. And these are thick-walled resting spores of the fungus. And these are produced to enable the fungus to survive unfavorable conditions. Another key difference is that bacterial spores are static, they're in one place unless they are physically removed. However, fungal spores can travel considerable differences. And this depends upon the fungus and the prevailing conditions. So the distance traveled is dependent upon the force of dispersal and also whether any other vectors are at play, such as whether the fungal spores are carried on air streams or by water droplets. The spores are also more likely to germinate when conditions are optimal. So fungal spores are more likely to germinate compared with bacterial spores. Another important factor, and this is now where we're going to have a look at disinfection, clean room controls and so on, and we need to have this understanding so we can use appropriate disinfectants at appropriate frequencies. So spores, as you can see from McDonald's classic hierarchy of resistance, are more resistant to disinfectants than most other microorganisms or other forms of biological material. So on the list, gram-positive vegetative bacteria tend to be the least resistant. Gram-negative bacteria, because they possess the additional outer membrane, which acts as an uptake barrier to disinfectants in the form of lipopolysaccharide, or above them, mycobacteria, 
and bacterial spores if we disregard prions which are not really a form of life are at the top and these are very resistant to disinfectants because of the spore coat and the cortex are acting as a barrier and bacterial spores are generally more resistant than fungi but there are some variables that we perhaps need to take into account which we'll have a look at in, in a minute okay so why are spores a concern so we should worry about spores because spores are as I mentioned earlier the mechanism that allows bacteria and fungi to survive adverse conditions and remember these are resting states, holding states, dormancy that will allow the spore to germinate under favourable conditions. So particularly with bacteria and fungi that's sufficient water. It's also important to understand that spores can form relatively quickly. So in the case of bacteria it takes less than six hours to change from a vegetative cell to a spore and then also back from a spore to a vegetative state is often under one hour and also spores are difficult to destroy so let's look at bacterial spores in this context so the diagram provides some level of detail about spore resistance so spores are resistant to many disinfectants and this is because of the relative impermeability of the spore coat particularly the polypeptides that make up the spore coat and these can stop many disinfectants from simply penetrating if disinfectants get through this layer then they've got additional barriers that are also going to provide a strong degree of resistance uh, and stop the disinfectant from penetrating the cortex and the protoplast both of these are effective at limiting chemical diffusion we also have a protein that's involved in spore coat formation that also interferes with the mechanisms of disinfectants. And this is called superoxide dimutase. And this helps create the particular thick styrated outer layer, that, that walnut style, um, if I can use that analogy, that, that, that stops the disinfectant from um, penetrating the bacterial cell. Now what about fungal spores? So fungal spores also have a degree of resistance. So fungal spores can also have an innate ability to present a permeability barrier, a permeability barrier to one or more disinfectants. And in theory they can be killed more easily than bacterial spores but some fungi can also secrete enzymes which can interfere with certain disinfectants and inactivate them. And in some cases with certain disinfectants um, fungi can be harder to kill depending on the species. So um, I found this out with um, hydrogen peroxide that was less effective against certain fungi and required a switch to chlorine um, dioxide to allow for a suitable contact time against both bacterial and fungal spores. Another problem with fungal spores is that when they are present they are invariably present in far higher numbers than would ever be found with bacterial spores and that's due to the sheer numbers of fungal spores that are, that are released relative to the chances of bacterial spores being present. And also based on cleaner vectors and things they can also spread more easily uh, and certainly outside in the, in the general airstream spread very easily indeed. We also need to be more nuanced when we're talking about um, spores because not all spores are equal. Just because a bacterium can form spores doesn't mean that every species of bacterium the spores are of equal resistance. So disinfectant test efficacy data suggests that some bacterial spores are harder to kill than others. So data suggests that Bacillus cereus, for example, is more resistant than Bacillus subtilis. And this can sometimes cause problems when we're developing a disinfectant um, regime to support a clean room. Another factor that we need to be uh, mindful of 
is that some spores are stickier than others and some are indeed very sticky and by sticky I mean the ability to bind to surfaces so this hydrophobicity this ability to get the strong physicochemical bonds that will attract a spore to a surface some organisms some species are more challenging than others so examples of very sp sticky spores are bacillus Vegetarium and Clostridium effringens as examples. And this stickiness may also increase resistance, as the study I've quoted on the slide by Weinick et al., uh, which is titled Hydrophobicity of Bacillus and Clostridium Spores, demonstrates, and that paper is well worth um, reading. There are other factors as well that we need to take into account. And this is that some spores, in fact, form uh, four layers rather than traditional three layers. And this is an additional protein, which is termed the exosporium. And this allows the spore to interact with its environment and perhaps to uh, produce signals that can uh, indicate that to the spore that the conditions are favorable for germination but the exosporium can also confer a degree of resistance and this has been found particularly with bacillus cereus um, which also makes explains again why this particular species of bacillus is very difficult to kill so this is a, another key factor that enables us to consider the disinfection regime and why we need to use a proven sporicide at a high degree of regularity, why we need to apply a detergent to try and get rid of as much dirt and soil as possible to give us a chance for a sporicidal disinfectant to penetrate because of these complexities and variable factors. Okay, so thank you very much for watching this short video. I'm Dr. Tim Sandal. Please check out my website, Pharmaceutical Microbiology, and please also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching and 